welcome to today's lecture on synthesis of elements beyond iron. So, as a recap, let me quickly summarize what we discussed in the previous lectures. After PP chain, CNO cycles, we have seen the importance of triple alpha process in the creation of carbon 12, where the role played by Hoyle state we have seen and in order to match with the observed abundance as Hoyle suggested there is a state in carbon 12. Fortunately, the difference between alpha threshold and the Hoyle state is less and the temperature available in that environment is sufficient to provide value E naught that is centroid of the gamma peak is sufficient to cause the resonance. The state is available to foster the resonance, so that the rate of carbon formation is in such a way that the ratio of carbon to oxygen is 0.6 and in the last lecture we have seen that it has to operate in a moderate rate, so that it is consistent with the ratio of carbon to oxygen. Then after carbon creation and survival, we have seen the different burning stages in the advanced stage. We have seen how carbon burning take place, the first fusion reaction within the nucleosynthesis that is carbon plus carbon 12, because there were no alpha particles, only carbon and oxygen which were the ashes of helium burning. And after carbon burning, as expected it was not oxygen burning, but it was neon burning, then comes oxygen burning and then silicon burning which leads to the formation of elements around iron peak. How elements are synthesized beyond this? How elements are synthesized beyond this? That is the topic of today's lecture. What is the, What are the physics processes? What are the salient features of synthesis of elements beyond the iron? Alright? So, nucleosynthesis beyond the iron that we are going to see what are the salient features and as part of quest for the origin of trans iron elements, let us see the most important curve diagram in this course, abundance curve, right. This I have shown good, good number of times in the initial stage of the course. Now, this abundance curve we are going to analyze from a different perspective that is the quest for trans iron elements and the synthesis of elements beyond iron. Alright? See the expected steepness in the abundance. If you see the hydrogen, then helium and how lithium, beryllium they are very small in abundance and then helium, carbon, oxygen they are above this lithium, boron and beryllium. right? and then neon, silicon, sulphur and then calcium. Overall the trend if you see it is bit steeper, right? Of course, there is an exception regarding the formation of iron elements. Suddenly it is going up from here to here there is a rise in the abundance of iron uh, elements around the iron peak, right? Overall except this uh, lithium, boron, beryllium and this iron peak, if you see the general trend is it is going steeper and steeper. So, if it continues, then the curve after iron is expected to be something like this, okay? but it is above this if you see the difference. So, people thought if it is the charged particle induced reactions or photo disintegration reactions which are happening till the formation of iron uh, elements around iron peak, then why cannot they continue after this? Of course, Coulomb barrier consideration is always there, even up to iron peak also Coulomb barrier consideration were there. So, when elements were able to form till iron peak, I mean uh, handling the Coulomb barrier consideration, why it cannot continue even after iron peak? If it continues, then the curve would have been you know much steeper, but practically the abundance data is showing it the curve is not much steeper as expected. Okay? So, expected steeper in the in the abundance curve 
is not observed based on charged particle induced reactions. Okay, charged particle induced reactions, if they are the reason for the formation of elements beyond the iron, then the steepness expected was not observed experimentally. All right. Instead, the observation was much slower decrease okay, and more abundance. Even the abundance data after the iron peak is more than expected if it was because of the charged particle induced reactions. So, these two observations against the trend expected by the people based on the charged particle induced reactions. So, the question naturally comes to our mind, what is the origin of elements beyond iron? All right. That is where Seuss and Urey, they have made a breakthrough. Whatever data they have collected and compiled that we are seeing here is helping us and the, some of the features of this diagram, they are helping us in order to understand the origin of elements beyond iron. So, it was the data compiled by Suyas and Urey, which helped in understanding the synthesis of elements beyond iron. Now, you can see here R and S and here you can see R and S. Here the peaks were designated with R and S, double peaks are there. And if you see the number of neutrons corresponding to these peaks, they were found to, to be found to be associated with 50 or 82 or 126. And by that time it was clear that shell model was existing and corresponding to the neutral shell filling, neutron shell filling at the magic neutron numbers 50, 82 and 126, the observed abundance curve is showing some peaks. All right. So, these details were discussed in detail by B square F H, Burbridge, Burbridge, Fowler and Hoyle, same Hoyle who has predicted the state in carbon 12, because of which the resonance reaction, because of which the creation of carbon 12 was in consistent with the carbon to oxygen ratio. All right. And independently Cameron also explained the abundance curve not only for the synthesis of elements below the iron, but also the synthesis of elements beyond the iron. All right. So, these are the papers which I think I have shown you in one of the previous lectures. Synthesis of elements in stars in 1957 and in 1957 same topic was covered by Cameron, both published independently and in the same year. So, these two papers helps us to have an idea about the synthesis of elements and how elements are cooked within the stars. So, readers are strongly recommended to go through these papers. Even now, researchers are considering this as classic papers in the field of nuclear astrophysics. All right. Okay, so, continuing our discussion on the origin of elements beyond the iron. For the synthesis of elements beyond the iron, we can always expect that iron and other nuclear nuclei of intermediate mass Okay, other nuclei of intermediate mass, they act as a seeds and this was the suggestions given by Gamow also and they are happening within the stars. And because neutrons are playing important role in the synthesis of elements, because it was a not charged particle, but the neutrons, then as expected, we can say that the reactions proceed in steps of one mass unit at a time all right and either they will occur at a slow rate when i say they occur the neutron induced reactions either they occur at a slow rate or at a rapid rate so this we call as s process and this we call as r process whose details we will discuss very soon all right so the hypothesis of formation of elements because of the nuclear reactions which are proceeding in steps of one mass unit and either they occur at a slow rate and a rapid rate, they are supported by the following interesting features. So, I am going to discuss five important features of abundance curve highlighting the elements beyond the iron peak. All right. The first feature which is supporting the hypothesis of neutron induced reactions. The explanation of structure of abundance curve 
cannot be done without assuming the neutrons. So, this uh, sounds bit tricky and uh, quite you know funny, but you know if you ignore the charged particle inducer reactions other than neutron there is no particle which can explain there is no other particle inducer reaction which can explain the structure of the abundance curve. So, this is one of the important features which supports our hypothesis. Number 2, people have occasionally observed from the star and other places in the universe large neutron fluxes. So, that means as I have discussed a few reactions in the previous lectures for example, 13 C alpha N. So, this reaction is one of the important reactions for the neutrons like that there are many other reactions while discussing the role of nitrogen 14 also we have seen how neutrons are produced of course, how they are consumed also alright. So, experimentally when people have observed large uh, neutron fluxes then they have thought yes from within the stars neutron fluxes can come out and also neutrons are formed within the stars in a big number. So, when neutrons are available there is uh, automatically a possibility that these neutrons will induce the reactions. So, this is the second feature of abundance curve all right and if we see the number of elements beyond the iron and the calculations have shown that 3 percent of iron peak elements elements around the iron peak only 3 percent are sufficient which should act as the seeds and they are available that is another feature. Now, one of the fascinating discovery which make made people confident that it is the neutron induced reaction because of which elements are synthesized beyond the iron peak and that is discovery of technetium in 1952. Of course, there are some contradictions when people say that on earth now technetium cannot be found only artificially one has to produce it there are few contradictions and the readers are strongly suggested to go through this paper of nature chemistry published in 2009 all right and it was generally believed that any technetium that might have been present when the earth was first formed has long since decayed radioactively we know this because even the longest lived isotope of the element technetium has a half life that is too short in comparison with the age of the earth but in 1956 okay japanese radiochemist uh, Paul Kuroda, I am presenting before you some of the contradictions. He predicted that a natural nuclear reactor might once have existed deep within the earth. I am talking about nuclear reactor beneath the earth, okay? natural nuclear reactor, it would have existed. Okay? And 5 years later, he reported that a simple a sample of African pitch blend, it contained about 2 into 10 to the power of minus 10 grams of technetium. See many times in uh, textbooks you, is, you will read that it is not possible to observe technetium on earth and some of the data which I am presenting they are in contradiction with what has been written in the textbooks. Okay? Let us see some more information about this technetium. All right? So, 2 into 10 to the power of minus 10 grams technetium was reported and uh, in 1962 a team of French scientists, they have confirmed the prediction of Kuroda that a natural nuclear reactor exists, it used to exist beneath the earth by investigating the rock samples in the Republic, Republic of Gabon in Africa. And the analysis have shown that there were trace amounts of technetium present in these minerals too. So, it is still contradicting the common textbook statement that technetium does not occur naturally on earth. Now, if you turn to the skies, it was detected in some so called red giant stars as long ago as in 1952. So, in red giant stars you can see the synthesis of technetium and what are red giant stars I have explained. Let me quickly uh, revise. The red giant stars are formed when helium burning takes place and the wavelength is shifted towards the higher wavelength that is the red one and because of the expansion of hydrogen in the shell surrounding the core is causing the big in size. So, the size of the star is quite big and the shifting of the wavelength towards red is causing the formation of red giant stars within which 
people have predicted the formation of technetium all right now in spite of its exotic heritage the technetium is now widely used in medicine as a diagnostic tool and molybdenum 99 radioactive molybdenum 99 is allowed to decay to form 99 meta stable state technetium okay it is in excited nuclear state this is the meta stable state which drops to the ground state with the loss of a gamma ray and this gamma ray can be measured in radio diagnostic procedures for the detection of tumors all right among other things and the usefulness of this technetium lies in a number of specific properties that it has okay and the decay of the excited form has a half life of about 6 hours and this 6 hours is very attractive property for the medical purposes okay because it is long enough to be injected into a patient before it decays but still sufficiently short for its emission intensity to be measurable at low concentrations moreover the short half life means that patient need only be exposed to a radiation for a brief period of time all right so this is all about the technetium whose discovery has confirmed the hypothesis of neutron induced reactions causing the formation of elements beyond the iron all right and many experimental observations have confirmed that heavier elements many a times they have high neutron capture cross sections so when neutrons are emitted because of the reactions happening before the iron peak synthesis elements around the iron peak uh, synthesis those neutrons if they somehow thermalize then the heavy elements that we are expecting beyond the iron peak they have very high neutron capture cross sections so the ability of the elements to capture the neutrons confirms the hypothesis that yes by capturing the neutrons new elements can be formed so this five features of abundance curve supports our understanding of neutron induced reactions reason which, which is the reason for the formation of elements beyond the iron peak all right now after discussing the salient features of the abundance curve supporting the hypothesis of neutron induced reactions of course we need some numbers regarding this neutron induced reactions we need to establish quantitatively so when i say quantitatively naturally it means that we have to know the behavior of cross section of this neutron induced reactions what is the order of neutron induced reactions cross sections let us see energy averaged neutron capture cross sections at the energies about 30 kV what is so special about this 30 kV i'll discuss very soon all right so we need the information on capture cross sections when the neutron energy is about 30 kV and we also need to know the mechanism of the neutron induced reactions and what is the time scale over which this neutron in induced reactions are happening and at what temperature these reactions are happening we need numbers corresponding to all these features all right and what are the sources of neutrons for reactions to happen we need to know what are the sources of neutrons so when you do measurements of the cross sections we will get information about all these things like mechanism of the reaction time scales temperature and what are the sources of neutrons and what are the neutron fluxes required for the reactions to happen to know this number also we need to measure the cross section of neutron induced reactions all right and what are the possible sites astrophysical sites for this neutron induced reactions so we need to have numbers corresponding to all these parameters all right let us see the neutron capture cross section if you see the relative probability and the neutron energy the cross section how it varies with the energy this i have explained earlier also now it plays very important role the understanding between the cross section of neutron reaction neutron induced reaction and the energy of the neutrons all right now in the stars when neutrons are formed with different energies due to different types of nuclear reactions they are poly energetic they are not certainly mono energetic right and this poly energetic neutrons they undergo elastic scattering with nearby nuclei and because of this elastic scattering and expected 
scattering uh, time scale is about 10 to the power of minus 11 second, they got thermalized. So, once a neutron are thermalized, the velocity distribution, of course, it follows the Maxwell Boltzmann as shown here. This is the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution and this is the cross section variation, all right. And the energy dependence of cross section as I have shown you, it is a 1 by V dependence. Can't it be 1 by V square? Yes, sometimes it could be 1 by V square. Then what about this discussion? It will change or different? We will see. It is a very interesting thing while understanding the neutron induced capture cross sections, all right. So, the cross section for the neutron capture reaction is proportional to 1 by velocity of the neutron okay. and what is this velocity of the neutron? 2 E by m and sometimes you can use the mu also where mu is the reduced mass all right. And as I said the reactions can occur with a slower rate or rapid rate and if it occurs with a slow, lower rate then we call it as S process whose features we will discuss more in due course. So, for S process the estimated temperatures are in the range of 0 0.1 to 0 0.6 giga kelvins, 0 0.1 to 0 0.6 giga kelvins okay. and E naught is around 30 keV. So, where from this 30 keV has come? I will explain now, fine. See, when sigma is proportional to 1 by V, we can always consider the product of sigma and V as a constant, all right. So, sigma is a constant and because they are thermalized, we can always say it is the constant value is also equal to the cross section corresponding to thermal neutron and velocity corresponding to thermal neutron, all right. Now, we are in a position to write reaction rate per particle pair, the average kind of thing sigma v the average value. It is also constant, but now I am writing the cross section as the averaged value and velocity of the thermal neutron outside this average. Are we allowed to write down this? I am saying are we allowed to write cross section only the average value and when I say average value it is the energy averaged neutron capture cross section okay? and thermal neutron velocity. All right? This is true not only for 1 by V dependence, but also nearly true, I am saying nearly true for 1 by V square dependence also. Because if you, if you do the simple calculation, the average cross section is about 1.13 sigma t. So, there is a small increment when compared to the 1 by V dependence. For 1 by V square dependence, it is just 0 0.13. So, it is ok in majority of the cases to consider both for 1 by V and 1 by V square dependence. We can always say that energy averaged capture cross section sigma can be considered. All right? And it has been observed that the energy averaged capture cross section, it is relatively independent of temperature for this energy range 10 to 100 keV. So, you can take any value from within this 10 to 100 keV. We can take any value within this 10 to 100 keV. So, that is how people have 0 upon 30 keV. So, there is a reason to select 30 keV as the some kind of standard and E naught value. All right. So, 30 keV is the most convenient energy for understanding the neutron induced reactions. And at this energy, if we are able to measure the reaction cross sections, then we will get better understanding of the synthesis of elements within the stars beyond iron peak. All right? And for wider temperature range, earlier I have shown you this 0.1 to 0.6. What about if temperature is high, higher than this? Then we cannot take sigma at certain energy like 30 keV, but it need to be measured over a wider range of energies. And then you have to fold numerically with the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. And once we fold the measurement of capture cross sections over a wide range of energies and Maxwell energy distribution, then this is how the capture cross section average value looks like. It is the folding between energy dependence of neutron capture cross section and the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution gives rise to this kind of formula for the cross section. All right? Now, how one can measure? S process, how one can measure the S process, which is happening with a slow rate. 
So, in order to measure the S process, then one has to go for uh, energy of the neutrons say even beyond little bit 100 kV like 1 to 300 kV and the most widely used facilities are LINAC that means linear accelerator or Van de Graaff accelerator. And using LINAC we cannot get directly neutron beam from any accelerator because they are not charged particles. So, you use pulsed high power electron beam and use a target so that you can get gamma in reactions and normally we can get this kind of reactions when you use target based on heavy metals. And using heavy metals when electron beam is used on the heavy metals, the reactions will give the neutrons and these neutrons have to be thermalized so that one can initiate the neutron reactions relevant for the nuclear astrophysics. And more details about S process and R process we will discuss in the next lecture. Thank you very much for the attention.